Hi guys! I'm making this quick video to show the difference between a master-slave dynamic and static flip-flop. The reason I'm doing this is because I've got a project that's coming up, assuming I can make it work, that uh, uses this theory. So a flip-flop is a device that can store a state or a bit for one clock cycle or more. Um, a static flip-flop is a device that you can remove the clock from it or suspend the clock and it will retain its state indefinitely, assuming no cosmic rays come through and cause the bits to flip or the power rails go away. Now a dynamic flip-flop relies on parasitic capacitance or even engineered capacitance between nodes to remember what its state is. Um, so if you suspend the clock, these capacitors will eventually bleed off their charge and you'll lose your state. Um, so there's some big advantages to using dynamic flip-flops. I mean there's a lot of downsides too, but um, the big one is that they can be much smaller. So a typical static flip-flop with no scan chains or anything like that in it would be about 18 transistors. A dynamic flip-flop can be 10 transistors if you do full restoring between each stage where the bits get restored to full logic level. Or you can do a more analog type where the uh, the bits are transferred through pass gates and uh, it can be down as low as six transistors. Or if you do like a dynamic memory, you can get down to just a few transistors per bit. All right, you know, dynamic um, registers were used a whole lot in the 70s and 80s when transistors were really big on chips and you couldn't put a lot of functionality into chips so they had to trade off um, ease of design to um, pack more functionality into the chips. They used a lot more dynamic designs. In the 90s, 80s, late 80s and 90s, um, transistor sizes got really small and you were able to use more static designs. Thank you Moore's Law. <laughs> so it fell out of favor. And you know, a funny thing is it's falling back into favor because um, the mass charges to um, make smaller and smaller transistors are going through the roof and transistors are getting leakier. So there's more incentive to go back to this design, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, um, the internals of a master-slave flip-flop, whether it's dynamic or static, are about the same. So you have two stages. You have a clock input. Now the clock gets separated into two phases. So you have an inverter that inverts and causes two phases. <clears throat> when data is present at the D input and the clock is high, the latch will open up and allow the bit to transfer into the middle node B here. And then when the clock flips, this latch will close off, retaining its state. And then the next latch will open up and it'll transfer to the output. And that's where the master slave comes from. And we can see it in the timing diagram here. Bit is present on the input clock goes high, transfers directly through the register into the to the B state uh, node, and then the clock will flip, inverter, causes that one to open up, and then it'll go to the output, node C, or your Q output. So the reason that you do master-slave flip-flops is to prevent race conditions. So if you just used a transparent latch, you could end up with a condition where you're input relies on your output and since it flows through almost instantly to the you know the, the delay of the the latch you can have os wild oscillations happen if you have any kind of feedback output to input all right so if we take a look at a master slave dynamic um, and this is what I've um, put together on my test rig here I have tri-state buffers which are about four transistors per buffer what they do is they open up, allow the state to pass through. There's parasitic capacitance on the, the chips that I use, just the capacitance of the gate to source and drain, the actual wires. Um, when you're inside of a chip, there's capacitance all over the place. You can um, usually not have to engineer it into the, the device. So same thing, um, bits present goes clock high, transfers in, gets stored onto this capacitor, then the clock goes low. And we can see on node B that there's a slow decay. 
that's through leakage through the transistors or you know in, the, in this case input protection so as long as the clock is fast enough this decay is slow enough that it doesn't get below the threshold level of the input of the next tri-state buffer and then on the next clock phase it transfers out to the output and then the parasitics on that store the charge. Alright, so for the test rig I put together a linear feedback shift register. This is a sequence generator. Um, this is what a static version would look like. It's a shift register with an XOR gate that feeds back. So this goes through 15 unique patterns. It only has one illegal state which is all zeros. So that's why I have an inverter here so that at power up these registers would be zero but one gets inverted which causes it to always start up. And this is the actual dynamic version of it. So we have the tri-state buffers, parasitic capacitance between each of them, and then I have it hooked up to the scope so we can see these different nodes and we can see the count and I have an XOR gate, an inverter that's running the, the counter phase clocks. So it bucket brigades down through there. Alright, so if we take a look at the scope, right here I have two nodes. So one of these nodes is the would be the node A, the input, and this other one would be the output. And we can see that a bit comes in here, half clock cycle later, gets shifted out. So master slave, master slave, master slave. Down here I have the decoded output of the linear shift back register starting with 0137 EDB which is the pattern that it repeats over and over again I'm triggering on the uh, sequence of one so if I start changing the clock on this device or this test rig we can see the decay of each of these bits get more and more I can get closer to the supply rail I mean to the uh, threshold eventually this will fall on its face and quit working there we go, it quit working. Since I'm using a CMOS part, it's 50% of the supply rail is the threshold. So once you get below that threshold point, um, it doesn't see it as a one anymore and won't propagate to the next stage. So that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, is there anything else I want to say? I don't think so. All right, guys. See you next time.